Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself with Senator Bob Graham. We're talking about the Saudi role in the events of 9-11 and Saudi's influence on U.S. US foreign policy. Uh, the biography of Senator Graham in length you will find below our video player here, but just quickly again, Senator Graham was the 38th governor of Florida from 1979 to 1987. He was a U.S. senator from Florida from 87 to 2005. He was on the Senate Intelligence Committee and he chaired the Congressional Joint Committee on 9-11. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. And I should say Senator Graham also is author of the book Intelligence Matters, the CIA, the FBI, Saudi Arabia, and the Failure of American War on Terror. So one question that's always kind of bothered me, because I, I personally haven't been able to find something obvious about this, and there's so much to read, and I haven't read it all, but it's been reported that Prince Bandar, who was then the uh, Saudi ambassador to the United States, within hours of 9-11, contacts what we now know must have been President Bush because all the heads of all the other agencies, it was very interesting, a 9-11 commission, they kept asking to the head of the FBI, did you authorize these flights to get Saudis out of the country? I said no, and then the CIA said no, but I think it's fairly no, well known now it was the White House. Uh, but Prince Bandar, within hours of the attack, wants to get leading Saudis out of the country because 15 of the 19 uh, conspirators on the planes are are Saudis. Well, how does he know within hours of the attack that there's so many Saudis involved in this? It doesn't surprise me that he knew that. Now, at the, at the worst, you can say he knew it because he was aware that this plot was developing uh, before 9-11. Uh, at the best, uh, his uh, press people had access to the wire services, which quickly did identify that 15 of the 19 people were Saudi. So I'm not... How, how did the American government and then the wire services, how did anyone know so quickly? Well, they quickly found out who the people were because they had their names on the manifest of the four airplanes which they had uh, entered. And uh, some of these people, once their names popped up, were well known to uh, the uh, intelligence agencies, two of them had participated in what's referred to as the summit of terrorists that took place in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia in January of 2000. Others were not as well known, uh, but it didn't take long uh, to determine something as basic as what were the nationalities of these 19 people. So that doesn't surprise me. What does surprise me is the reaction of the United States, and I think this was at the highest level, the President of the United States, how they reacted uh, to this request. Uh, here you have a mass murder, uh, mainly U.S. citizens killed. Uh, here you've got s people uh, who might have information about uh, this mass murder that law enforcement would like to fully uh, uh, interrogate before they were out of our jurisdiction. Uh, and yet uh, the President of the United States agreed uh, at the request of the Saudi ambassador uh, to allow a chartered plane uh, to fly from Lexington, Kentucky back to the Middle East with 144 persons uh, who had not been pre-screened, uh, uh, interviewed, uh, or in any meaningful manner debriefed in terms of what they knew about uh, this situation. After the flight, the FBI said, had we known that the, who these people were, we would, in fact, have uh, interviewed a number of them. Uh, so how do you explain people of interest. I think the, the explanations uh, are murky, and there are many. One is that the United States has had a special relationship with Saudi Arabia that goes back to World War II. We provide them a defense cover. They provide us a reliable source of petroleum. Uh, some of it was the special relationship with the Bush family. Uh, going back to the president's grandfather, there had been a close family relationship uh, between the Bushes uh, and the House uh, of Saud. Uh, uh, other reasons might uh, have to do with the fact that Saudi Arabia was looked at as being a source of stability in a very turbulent Middle East and that we uh, needed to keep their 
uh, credibility and respond to their request. Uh, Bandar had said that uh, precisely because uh, three quarters of the hijackers had been Saudis, that that put all persons of Saudi ancestry in the United States at some risk. And he selected who he thought were the ones that were most at risk, most prominent, probably closest to the royal family uh, to have this. And members of the bin Laden family. Yes, uh, there were several members of the bin Laden family, which meets both tests. They were members of the bin Laden family, and that family was itself close to the royal family. Uh, and uh, at a time when the request was made, uh, most aviation in the United States was grounded. Uh, by the time they actually executed uh, the flight, uh, that restriction had largely been lifted. The, uh, I think the, the big issue isn't did the fly, how could the plane fly. The big issue is how did they let a plane fly with people that might have been involved in the events? Because they w weren't very curious as to what those people had known. Or there were, I think more likely, there were factors that went beyond finding out about 9-11 that trumped uh, the normal policy of full briefing and interrogation or debriefing and interrogation before people were allowed to leave the country. We'll kind of get into this as we move along, but, but does there not seem to you, uh, and in your book you outline various points at which the 9-11 attacks could have been prevented? About a dozen. Does there not seem to have been almost a culture, it's almost deliberately created, not uh, that goes beyond lack of curiosity? And, and like I've, I don't understand this. If it re you 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 become you're president, you take over a, a new administration. Your your head of CIA comes in in his first briefing, and according to George Tenet, he tells President Bush the number one security threat to the United States is Bin Laden and Al Qaeda. And, and then they demote Richard Clark. How do you demote your national, your, your terrorism, anti-terrorism czar and, and at a time when you've been told this is your biggest national security threat? If you don't like Clark, fine, you get somebody else, but why would you reduce his level, which was more or less cabinet level access, to when like Clark testifies at 9-11, he couldn't get anyone's attention. He says, My, our hair was on fire. There was so much going on that summer that we thought something might be coming and we couldn't get anyone's attention. Uh, it's almost like they don't, like it goes beyond almost that lack of curiosity. Yeah, this culture of protection of the Saudis uh, ran up and down the ranks of the federal government. Uh, a very significant event occurred at the Orlando uh, airport uh, in uh, 2001, early in the year, uh, when a, uh, a man arrived uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and was seen by one of the agents at the airport, one of the customs agents, as being suspicious. And so they interviewed him to find out why would a person have flown all the way uh, from Saudi Arabia to Orlando uh, for what appeared to be just a few uh, days, maybe even hours, before they, he turned around and flew back. Uh, and th there had been some instances of, in which professional hitmen were brought into the United States to carry out uh, a murder and then quickly leave. And the customs agent was suspicious that that might be such a person. So he refused the man the uh, right to uh, enter the United States. He was severely chastised by other customs agents who said, your career is now over because don't you remember we were told that we're supposed to treat Saudis differently than we treat uh, other people? Uh, but he persisted, and in fact the man was returned without ever gaining legal access to the United States. That may have been, probably was, the 20th hijacker that, who would have filled out the ranks uh, of the uh, uh, five people on each of the four planes. Uh, but e even at the level of a customs agent uh, at an airport in the United States, the idea that Saudis were going to be treated with greater deference was an accepted part of the operation. You can imagine what it was like as you moved up into the higher ranks of the federal government. 
Well, if you combine that with what was clearly a message that was sent throughout the police, through the FBI, to the intelligence agencies, that we're not very interested in terrorism anymore. Uh, Colleen Rowley, that was part of the FBI uh, group in Minneapolis, that tried to get a warrant uh, for Masawi, uh, who was uh, this guy learning to take off and not land, and, and the air flight instructor tells the local FBI office, and, 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 they, and they cannot get the warrant. FBI headquarters won't give them the warrant to go get the computer. Uh, and that's a longer detailed story, and if people want, they can go watch. We've interviewed Colleen Rowley. But I asked Colleen, what did you make of this? I mean, why? And she said, there just seemed to be, uh, coming from the top, a culture. Don't follow terrorism. We're not interested in it. Yeah. Uh, and we had a number of instances uh, such as that. There was a very uh, uh, suspicious and I think potentially central figure in the Saudi relationship to the hijackers who was an elderly man, retired uh, university professor, uh, who in his uh, dotage uh, had uh, taken to inviting young Saudis to live in his house as boarders it was both a source of some income but also some comfort. It happened that two of the boarders that this man invited uh, to live in his house were future uh, hijackers. We very much wanted to interview that uh, elderly former professor to find out just what had he learned having these two hijackers living uh, literally under his roof. Uh, we were denied access. Uh, here's the Joint Intelligence Committees of the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives are being told, you cannot talk to this man. Uh, we said, could we send you questions and uh, Who is this the you're FBI? FBI. And they say, no, we won't present the questions to him. So we went to a federal judge and got a subpoena to require this man's arrival. It was on a Friday afternoon. I had the subpoena in my hand. Uh, the FBI agent in charge was in a small room uh, in the Capitol, and I was prepared to hand him the subpoena. And he, he backed up against the wall and said, we don't like to have our uh, people subpoenaed. Uh, they described him as being our people because he was in addition to taking in borders, he also was paid by the FBI to s allegedly oversee the actions of young Saudis. Uh, yeah, isn't that the point? He was an FBI informant. Yeah, so that's why they were hiding him so much. But anyway, the man said, don't give me, don't force the subpoena on us. On Monday, 72 hours from now, we will deliver this man. So. The biggest mistake maybe I made in my public life was accepting uh, the, the truthfulness, the veracity of that man's statement because we, I did not uh, push the subpoena into his hands. Uh, 72 hours passed, no witness came forward and from that point forward they just ran the clock out until the uh, session of Congress that we had legal authority to conduct our investigation ran out and uh, to my knowledge nobody has ever interviewed that uh, man who I think has a lot to say and to contribute to our understanding of the Saudi role in 9-11. Where is he now? Uh, I think he's still in San Diego the last time I checked which was three or four years ago he was. This must frustrate you to no end that that you weren't able to finish your work in a sense and then and then it has left the public discourse. There's no further inquiries. Yeah. Well, it, what have I've been thinking a lot about recently, and we're going through the period recognizing the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, a lot of this discussion has gone back to various theories about uh, how was Oswald able to do this? Was he helped by the mob, by uh, the Cubans or somebody? Uh, my question is, what difference does it make? If you'd found out that, yes, there was such a conspiracy, how is that relevant to any decision that we would be making today? In contrast, uh, the issue of whether the 19 hijackers 
acted alone or whether they had a support network has enormous uh, uh, current consequences if in fact the Saudi government was the source of financial, logistical support, provision of anonymity that allowed these people to stay in the country such a long time and go undiscovered. If they were part of the, of the system that made that happen, think of what it would mean to U.S.-Saudi relations uh, today. It would be uh, a, uh, a complete overturning of the premises upon which we have been dealing with Saudi Arabia, that it was a loyal ally of the United States, to now being seen uh, as a country which was prepared uh, to sell its soul to the, to the worst uh, in the world, uh, even if that meant uh, putting uh, the United States uh, in jeopardy and the loss of life of 3,000 people. Okay, in the next part of our interview, We'll ask Senator Graham a little more about why he thinks this is the case. Please join us on Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News with, with Senator Bob Graham.